<laughs> sure. Hi, everyone. Um, good evening. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. I'm really, I'm really thrilled to welcome everyone to this book read discussion with Gerald Walker. Uh, my name is Andrew Turner, and I'll be the, I guess you could call me the moderator this evening. Um, I'm really excited to be here. My wife and Jody and I live in Hingham with our two kids. We have a dog named Molly, and uh, I am a member of the Hingham Unity Council. Uh, and like I said, just really thrilled to be able to welcome everyone this evening. Before we get started, let me say a quick note about um, the Hingham Unity Council, or HUC. Uh, HUC is a nonpartisan, nonprofit group formed to facilitate open, respectful, in-person dialogue about systemic issues that affect human dignity with the goal of creating a more inclusive and welcoming community. We are part of the South Shore Unity Council, and we always welcome new members, so please visit our website at hinghamunity.org for upcoming events and more information on ways to get involved. Uh, so I am thrilled to be able to introduce Gerald Walker, our featured guest this evening. Uh, I'm going to give you his um, distinguished biography as a means of introduction, uh, and, uh, and then we will begin the evening. So Professor Gerald Walker is a graduate of the IRA Writers Workshop and has been published in magazines such as Creative Nonfiction, the Missouri Review, the Harvard Review, Mother Jones, the Iowa Review, and the Oxford American, and he has been widely anthologized, including five times in the best American essays. Dr. Walker is the author of Street Shadows, a memoir of race, and rebe uh, race rebellion and redemption, which I have here, uh, which is the recipient of the 2011 Penn New England LL Winship Award for Nonfiction and named Best Memoir of the Year by Kirkus Reviews, and The World in Flames, A Black Boyhood in a White Supremacist Doomsday Cult. His latest book, not this one, this one, and the one we're here to discuss this evening, How to Make a Slave and Other Essays, was a finalist for the 2020, 2020 National Book Award in Nonfiction and winner of the 2020 Massachusetts Book Award in Nonfiction. He has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, National Endowment for the Arts, and the James A. Michener Foundation. Dr. Walker's doctorate is in interdis interdisciplinary studies, combining the fields of African-American literature, African-American history, and creative writing. He is currently a professor of creative writing at Emerson College, and before this was an associate professor of English at Bridgewater State University. Finally, Dr. Walker has also been a visiting professor in the program in writing and human humanistic studies at MIT, and in the MFA in nonfiction program at the University of Iowa. His teaching honors include Favorite Faculty Award and the Martha D. Jones Award for Most Outstanding Dedication to Students. So Gerald, welcome and thank you so much for being here this evening. Uh, one last logistical note for folks, um, I have prepared some questions, um, but if you have additional questions for Gerald, please submit them in the chat box to Lori. She's one of our co-hosts. Um, so with all of that out of the way, welcome. And thank you so much for, for being here tonight. Thank you, thank you, Andrew. Can I say something about that introduction? You did it really, really well. <laughs> Why is it so long? Why, I have to I have to go to my web page and cut that thing in half. Nobody wants to hear all that stuff. I don't know, it's, it's pretty amazing. It's it's very distinguished. I uh, I feel like it sets the stage for, uh, I don't know, for, for uh, I had not been, introduced to your writing before hearing you at the Hingham Historical Society. And um, I think the length of the introduction uh, doesn't do justice, frankly, to the power in these words and in this book. I, I really, really enjoyed it. I hope everyone else did. If you have not read it, please buy it and read it. It's wonderful. Um, and so uh, I, I think you could probably go on and on with accolades, uh, Gerald. I, I really thought it was a, a tremendous uh, a tremendous read, so much so that I read the other one. I only have one more to go. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I appreciate that. In that case, I'll keep it. I'll leave it the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, let, let me start um, this evening. Uh, like I said, I have a few pre prepared questions. Um, let me start this evening with one. Um, as I mentioned, gosh, maybe about a month ago or so, there was a presentation at the Hingham Historical Society where they recognize you as a Hingham history maker, which I think is very cool. Um, and uh, you mentioned last month in that talk that your mentor, James Allen McPherson, encouraged you not to rely on stereotypes and even ones derived from your own personal experience and spend less time on the dragons, as you put it in Dragon Slayer. Can you talk a little bit about what he meant and maybe how his advice shaped the essays and your broader writing? Sure. Um, great question to kick the evening off. Um, in addition to thanking you, I would also like to thank the um, 
Ingham Unity Council for inviting me. I am really um, impressed with the work that you're doing. And the more I learn about it, the more I am uh, grateful to be in a town that would have an organization like yours. Um, one of the things that I, a trap I fell into as a young writer, and I think all writers fall into this trap, it's kind of a rite of passage, is to write in general vague terms. You write about the things that have occurred to you um, in such a way that you can understand it and you try to convey it in a way that's understandable. And so you don't get so specific about events in a way that would personalize who you are or what it is you're writing about. You find yourself speaking in generalities. And the problem with generalities is that uh, people can draw very negative conclusions from them and sometimes positive as well. But in either case, they misrepresent what the truth of the matter often is. To be more specific and not speak in generalities, uh, I was writing um, stories about my life that were for someone who didn't know my life or didn't know my experience, were stereotypes. Um, I was raised in a poor community on the south side of Chicago, and I got involved in various um, petty criminal activity. That is something people hear about Black poor people all the time. Mm -hmm. And if you keep your stories on that level, then that's all people come to understand of your experience, these broad strokes. They don't find out who people are as individuals. And if you don't see people as individuals, it makes it even more difficult for you to connect your life to their life. If all I talked about was being raised in a poor community on the South Side of Chicago, someone who was raised in Hingham will probably say, yeah, we don't have a whole lot in common. But if I move in closer to my story and move beyond the stereotype and say, while I was on, in that poor neighborhood on the South Side of Chicago, my uncle got sick and it really tore my family apart to watch his slow demise. Mm -hmm. Well, now I've gotten a little bit beyond the stereotype and I've said something specific about my life that maybe you in Hingham can relate to because perhaps you had someone in your family who also got sick and you recognize the pain that I speak of. And so the more specific you talk about your life and experience, the more likely someone who may believe they have a very different life experience can begin to recognize themselves in your story. And that was what I had to learn when writing my own work, that I had to move beyond the generalities of my life so that people could see that my story in many ways is also their story. And you can't make that connection until you start getting specific about your life and not writing in these broad strokes. And I may say, actually, even not only specific, but at times um, very honest and very vulnerable. Uh, I, I I walked away um, from both books thinking to myself, like, man, that takes a lot of guts to really put yourself out there with, um, like you said, the deep specifics of your life in an attempt to, in my case, create a connection, certainly where I felt a certain amount of um, respect uh, for your bravery, for your vulnerability, for your honesty. Um, that really emerged to me. And I, I wonder... Um, I wonder if that's scary on, on how that might land with folks, uh, because maybe they maybe folks don't all have the same reaction. For me, I felt like it brought me closer to you as a writer in some way. Um, but I wonder if there's a certain amount of, of fear that 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 comes along with that. Well, it was terrifying. <laughs> I, I uh, for many years, I was reluctant to write about my life. I started out as a fiction writer for that very reason. Um, I didn't want to put myself on the page. I didn't want to reveal some of my mistakes and failings. Uh, I simply wanted to hide behind the mask of fiction and tell these stories. Um, but one of the things I realized is once I started writing nonfiction and once I um, began to not be so fearful of sharing my true story, is that the stories that I was attempting to conceal are the very stories that you're attempting to conceal about yourself. And that everybody listening to me speak now also has stories they would probably rather not talk about. But it is in the revealing of our true selves 
that people began to make the connections. I suspect, Andrew, as you read my stories, um, you did feel closer to me, not only as a writer, but as a human. And here's a guy who's going through so much stuff that in so many ways I can relate to. Again, some of the general descriptions may differ, but in Street Shadows in particular, mm -hmm. it's a difficult story to write because it really captured my struggles as a, as a teenage delinquent. Um, that was a hard, hard story to write. And it was difficult to be as honest on the page as I felt I needed to be in order for the story to work. Uh, but I felt also by the time I had confessed, so to speak, my sins, that I had in some way freed myself up from being uh, strangers to my readers and also to myself. That once we expose ourselves right down to the core and there's nothing else to hide, then there's nothing else to lose either. And people seeing you for who you are and recognizing this person's got flaws, some serious flaws in some ways. You know what? So do I. And I think that that's an important thing um, for, for writers, certainly of nonfiction, to come to understand, but for readers of it as well. But to go back to your original point, I, and I think I may have mentioned this when I gave my presentation a month ago, um, I, was, I was very, very fearful of being honest on the page. And it was uh, my wife, Brenda, who suggested that I be honest about the stories that I was telling. And to not see myself as someone who would be criticized or ridiculed or feared or any of the things I was worried about, but that hope that people would move beyond that and see um, that I'm a hero that I'm a hero like every average person is who's simply struggling to make sense out of the senselessness of life and struggling to bring order to the chaos of life. And that's all my stories are about. That's all I write about. Mm -hmm. And that makes me a hero. It makes every one of you a hero, everybody who's battling something and perhaps not successfully always, and maybe not always in victory, but the people who are doing the daily struggle are um, heroic in ways that I think, again, connects us as humans. Yeah, that, that was absolutely my experience. Absolutely my experience. Um, you know, one other, one other thread through these essays is um, that there's a certain amount of humor, uh, that um, it, it's sort of this balance of seriousness and humor, sometimes line to line, which I found um, just wonderful. Sometimes it's self-deprecating. Um, sometimes you're poking fun at other people uh, or situations, which which I liked. And I was I, I wonder, um, can you tell us about what role you think humor or levity uh, plays in sometimes serious discussions about race and racism? I honestly don't see how you can effectively talk about um, race without injections of humor now and then. Um, it's one of the things that Richard Pryor uh, taught us, who was a master of discussing race relations in the United States, and yet he made us laugh at the same time. Um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a smart strategy. If your goal is to have people pay attention to what you're saying, um, one way to do that is to give them an opportunity to exhale now and then. Mm. And laughter allows for exhale. It allows people to not be so uptight about these conversations uh, and not um, feel as if the weight of the world is residing on these discussions. But every now and then we can take a step back and we can laugh at ourselves. We can see the humor in what it is we're going through and still get down to the real hard work of trying to uh, make these relationships um, be successful. But you have to do what James Allen McPherson, to go back to my mentor, stressed to me was so important. And that's to mix the tragic with the comic, to try to give the um, important weight to each side and not focus too much on one or too much of, of the other, but just to do what it is that life itself does. And that is to be sometimes very, very sad and sometimes very, very funny, but try to find a way to blend the two 
so that we can um, appreciate both the, the the ups and sometimes the downs of of daily existence. Yeah, and I, I think the balance for at least for me was was spot on. There was it was sort of never a silliness, and there was never an overt seriousness. That the the interplay between the two was was there in the right balance for me. And I think you said, I like how you said it allowed you to exhale. Uh, I find myself sort of, you know, ch- it, th- thinking maybe, maybe, I don't know, as deeply as I can think, and then maybe chuckling a little bit and then coming back and being able to stay with it. Um, that, that certainly was my experience. Um, we have, um, we do have a, a, a couple questions from the chat. So maybe I'll sort of intersperse um, different questions. This one is, um, if from someone uh, that may be an aspiring writer. So let me let me read it here. It um, it goes like this. How did you go about getting your first book published? And did someone approach you or did you pursue publishing? And this is the part of the, the, the question that I like. What would your advice be to a young BIPOC writer or student who wants to speak to their experiences? Um, okay, um, first part of that first. Um, I got my first book published after someone wrote me out of the blue after seeing an essay I wrote published in the Chronicle of Higher Education. Um, He wrote me and simply introduced himself as a literary agent. He saw my essay and wondered if I had any more. I said, boy, do I. (laughs) I've been stockpiling these things for years and unable to to get someone to um, buy my work. And so he asked me to send them. And so I sent them a stack of essays and he got me in contact with uh, someone here in Boston who also was a living agent who asked to see me and we met for lunch. And I told him what I was working on and he said, let's write up a proposal and see if we can get this published. And so we did, he wrote it up and someone bought uh, my first book without me having uh, written all of it. I had written many of it, many of the essays or the chapters, but that was how I was discovered, just completely out of the blue. It doesn't happen like that often. Um, I was grateful that that worked out. Um, And part two of the question was a young BIPOC writer who was trying to figure out how to make it as a writer. Yeah, what would your advice be to a young BIPOC writer or student who wants to speak to their experiences? Um, do it. <laughs> speak your experience. I mean, you have to write about your experience, but I, um, I, more important, perhaps, I would say, than experience is learning to write well. Craft comes first, and having a story to tell is only half the battle if you haven't made yourself competitive with all the other writers out there who know how to construct a sentence well. <laughs> You have to, you really have to work on your craft, work on your storytelling, read as much as you possibly can and learn how to make your narratives so enticing that people will want to read them on the basis of the quality of the sentence itself. And then when they also see that you have a story to tell that you've lived in an, an important experience that's valuable for other people to know about, then that in some ways is the icing on the cake. But don't try to do it in reverse. Hmm. Don't say, I've lived this certain life and people Hmm. ought to know about it. Because that's not going to be enough if you haven't also done the work to make sure that your writing can compete with the best writing that's out there. Craft is important. I I, I share this with you at the Hingham Historical Society and I'll share it uh, with the group tonight is that... um, on the, on the idea of craft is that uh, I can't remember a time when I ever walked away from an essay or a, or a novel or a piece of um, journalism where I didn't specifically notice how great your first sentences are in every essay. And I wonder, I, I'm, I, I, and I, to this, when I was preparing for this talk, I went back and I just reread them, just, just the first lines. And so I'm wondering when you sit down to start that story or that essay, um, where do you begin with that craft? Is there, a, with, the, with the risk of this becoming a writer's workshop, I am very curious, there, there's care and like, oh, I am in instantly in a matter of words. And, and it sets up not just the essay itself, but the whole, the whole collection. 
how, how do you do you have a process about that how do you how do you start yes i have a process i write probably a thousand really bad sentences <laughs> for the one that makes it into the book makes it into the book uh, often um what i do when i write an essay they don't you know begin perfectly and and i don't know if they ever achieve perfection but i'll just simply start telling the story as well as i can at some point during the early drafts of the essay, I will write a sentence and I'll just have to take a pause and admire it. <laughs> he does it so good. Doesn't happen often, but I'll, I'll write it and I'll say, wow, <laughs> that's a really good sentence. And you know what I'll do? I will cut and paste it and put it right at the beginning of my essay. Interesting. And then everything has to flow from it because I've just set a standard for myself. Hmm. I've set the bar. That sentence has got to demand the same level of quality from all that follow. I have to try to meet that standard, not only in how well I crafted the sentence, but also in the way it's what it is it's telling the reader, how well it captivates the reader's imagination, how it moves, its, its rhythms, all of that kind of sets the stage for me and it sets my own bar and I try to live up to it as I go. And often it sometimes happens if I'm really, really lucky, I'll write a better sentence somewhere else. And you know what happens to that first sentence? <laughs> God. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it gets, I, I don't delete it. I put it somewhere else. <laughs> I, I really try to put my, my, my best foot forward, so to speak. And I tell my students one reason why you want to do that is, again, it comes to competition. I mentioned before that it's important for all writers to be competitive against other writers because this is, that's what this is. You're a lot of writers out there. How are you going to get um, separation from everyone else unless you're doing something as well as, if not better than everyone else? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, my students in particular, I can't get them to understand as well as I would like to. Um, they need to understand this main thing. Nobody wants to read your stuff. <laughs> we're too busy there, you see all these books out there everybody's writing stuff there's newspapers there's stuff and who knows what trump is doing next we got to pay attention to all these different things <laughs> we don't have time to read you unless you demand our attention hmm. and you get one sentence to do it everybody's got time for one sentence hmm. just walk by you pick up this book and you just oh, I don't, another book yet another <laughs> book and it's a, and you read a sentence. That's your shot. It's true. That's your chance to get the reader to go to the next sentence, and then the next, and the next, and the next. But it all begins with the first one. And if your best sentence is on page four, paragraph three, they may not make it. Bring that sentence forward, and then demand of yourself the same attention to its quality so that the reader can follow you through your piece. I'm wondering as you talk about your students, and I'm I'm kind of checking the um, uh, I, I'm visually checking some of the folks on screen just to assess approximate age. They, you know, they're they're presumably younger, maybe not all, but presumably younger than certainly than me. And I, and I wonder if there's a way in which they're approaching their writing, and specifically the way they're writing about difficult issues of race or sexuality or gender or whatever, in a way that you've seen is different. Um, over time, are, are younger writers, younger students arriving at these places with either different stories or different points of view or different techniques? And how that, how does that emerge as you're trying to help them both maybe find their voice as a writer, but also find their voice as potentially another generation with something to say about these issues? Well, I mean, the thing that I've noticed over the 20, almost 25 years now I've been teaching is a, a much greater willingness to to tell these stories hmm. because often they simply weren't told or they were hinted at or they were um, generalized in the same way that I spoke of my own work um, that they don't really mean a whole lot. But students now are writing about their lives in great detail with great honesty and great openness. And I'm, I appreciate that a lot, uh, but I still stress to them that they've got to also go the extra step of making themselves individuals on the page. I'm working with a fantastic student now, one of my graduate students, we're working on her thesis. And um, 
it's kind of a good news, bad news story for her. The bad news is that she was raised by drug addicted parents hmm. who um, really neglected her and her two younger siblings to the point that their lives were endangered. That's the bad news. The good news is that she was raised by drug addicted parents who neglected her and her siblings <laughs> because it's fantastic material. <laughs> I mean, she's got, I mean, as a writer, she, she's, she's lucky in the sense that she's been giving, given this material and this plot to try to make sense out of and to craft a, uh, an important story for the rest of us as readers. So she's got great material, but she at times slips into narrating the story in such, again, vague terms, and I keep coming to this, mm -hmm. but such vague terms that someone with a decent imagination, but not this experience, could tell the same story. You wouldn't know the difference between the two. Interesting. So for someone to have lived this horrible experience, but be unable to have it be believable on the page mm. um, is, is, a, is a crime. Mm. And so she's, she really got to do the work of making herself and the story so specific that it's recognizable as only hers and only hers to tell. Mm. And may I ask too, what about the students on the other side that have, uh, how do I say this, no, uh, boring upbringings? N nothing of, uh, and, and, and maybe uh, I, might, I, I might actually guess how you might answer, but wh where they would say, you know, there's no, nothing has been interesting about my life. I, I'm, I'm a teenager that's been, I don't know, raised in Hingham and I had a normal life. I didn't have a lot of tragedy, maybe thankfully, of course. I'm curious, similarly, as you're encouraging them to be honest and vulnerable, um, is it, a, is it more of a struggle for them to get into a place where they just find the things that are authentic and real? Uh, how, how about this, the folks on the other side of the equation where, you know, you, you think of them normal, I'm putting that in air quotes, but, you know, something that seems unremark otherwise unremarkable. The unremarkable lives sometimes make the best stories because that's where a lot of um, reflection comes in, a lot of thinking, a lot of considering of events, um, considering what's going on around us, maybe even considering the tragic lives of people who were not as fortunate as you. Uh, what the difficulty for these students isn't so much a lack of, of a traumatic experience, it's a lack of confidence to recognize that their stories matter too, and that they can tell their experiences. They don't necessarily have to have bloodshed or poverty or crime or any of those things. They can simply be stories that consist of all of the aspects of the human condition that make us the same. If you're writing a story about losing your puppy, <laughs> which sounds like it may not be about much, but that's a story about love. And we all understand and have experienced love stories. There's value in telling that. You could tell a story about cutting your lawn <laughs> and wondering what it is the guy who drove by you yelled out his window, which is the story I just finished writing not long ago. <laughs> it doesn't seem like as much, but these things happen and you can just try to figure them out. And one of the things that writers, nonfiction writers in particular, are charged with doing is simply thinking on the page. That plot isn't always created by car chases and gunfights and all of these, you know, fist fights and bars. No, plot is created by thinking hmm. and trying to figure something out. One of the great joys of reading for me when I read an essay is watching someone think on the page and trying to understand something that puzzles them. That creates conflict. Conflict is the heart of all good narratives. Hmm. So simply watching someone thinking, well, on the one hand, if I do this, that could be harmful. But if I do that, that could, but what if I do this? Hmm. And what if I, and readers are watching you try to sort this stuff out. Hmm watching this plot unfold, which is simply a mind at work. So you don't have to have all of these different stories. You simply have to be willing to 
follow where your train of thought leads you. And in the process, the plot of that narrative can begin to take its own shape and its own importance. I, I love that message. Let me um, let me go back to our book. Um, there's a essay called The Heritage Room, um, which I really enjoyed. And let me let me read just a little quote from it. Um, you write that racism is part and parcel of our culture, the great American disease with which we are all afflicted. There will be no cure until we accept this diagnosis. And that in the essay, one of the effects of this is that there has been a centuries old stereotype of the angry and violent black male that had duped us into thinking that was what we were supposed to be. And in this essay, for those for folks that haven't read it, a colleague of, of Gerald's um, had been duped by this stereotype. Um, and I want to poke in on that word duped. I think the, the character's name was Judy. The colleague's name was Judy. Um, mm -hmm. And this word duped that it's like Judy had been tricked by racism, almost like she couldn't help it. And I'm wondering if, is that what you meant? That that either for Judy or that in some ways that racism dupes and tricks all of us? I think it does. I think that that is the point. I think that, um, and sometimes we wanna be duped and tricked, um, but I think, and I think in her case that it may have been at work as well. What Judy convinced herself or had been convinced to believe was that if a black man gets angry, the next step is violence, that it's inevitable. Mm -hmm. And she, um, but I also have been tricked. I've been duped by that stereotype as well. Even though I was living a life that was proving its falsehood because I got angry, like all people get angry, but I rarely got violent. In fact, I don't recall ever getting violent when I was in my teens, unless I was involved in some altercation. But I didn't, um, I didn't see myself as any more prone to violence than any other person on the planet. And yet I still believed in the stereotype of the violent black male, because that is what society had been telling everybody in this culture for centuries. So you hear that long enough and often enough that you start to believe it. You start to be tricked into believing the narrative is real when in fact it's not. And it's interesting that it tricks everybody. It, it's not sort of tr tricking a, a single person or a single entity or a group of folks. It's that it's it's consumed everyone such that everyone's being duped or tricked. Is that right? I think that's, I mean, that's the case. The, the, the thing is, um, no one in America's psyche is outside of race. Mm -hmm. Like this is the soup. We're all in this. Yeah. So how how can you be immune to its effects? and the narratives that have been repeated over and over and over again. And you have to consciously guard against them. You have to will yourself to not be uh, lazy enough to allow them to take hold in your belief system. I mean, yeah. I've been guilty myself sometimes. I'll, I'll, it, I remember once when I was, um, this was many years ago, when I was on the south side of Chicago, and I was... Um, on a train station waiting for a train and I wasn't really paying attention to my surroundings. But a couple of guys, a couple of black guys, it was a black neighborhood, a couple of black guys just came around the corner kind of abruptly rushing for a train. I was convinced they were coming for me. The yeah. one split second, yeah. I allowed myself to be lazy in my thinking. Yeah. And to allow all of these false narratives to suddenly appear to be true until I snapped out of it and said, no, these guys are running for a train. Mm -hmm. um, but it happens if you, you have to you kind of have to be on guard against it or you will every once in a while um, fall for, as Barack Obama likes to say, the okie doke. <laughs> it's it's uh, this there's this idea, I think, of sort of type one and type two thinking, which is the type one thinking is the instinctual. Uh, I'm trying to make sense of all the stimulus at once. And I have these mental shortcuts that allow me to make decisions and survive because it's all coming at me too much. But that. That, that's where the tricking and the duping happens. And is that if you sort of slow down and enter this like sort of type two, more cerebral thinking, you realize like, wait a minute, those guys are just trying to catch a train or that person is just trying to do this or that person is just trying to do that. 
Um, but to the extent that we live most of our life in type one, it has to be interruptive and deliberate to enter that uh, sort of type two space. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me um, let me grab another um, question from the from the uh, from the group. Um, it says many of us live in a bubble and never experience what you have seen and experienced. How do you hope we might be changed by the stories that you tell? Um, my stories are windows into uh, my particular experiences. And um, that's the beauty of reading is that it allows you to share in lives that are um, different from yours and to see perspectives that you might not have considered and to experience cultures and customs that are foreign to you. That's the beauty of it. And that's what I hope anybody who um, reads my work will come away um, with. But on the other side of that, that's, that's kind of the um, means. It's not the end of what I hope people get out of my reading. I do hope that by the time somebody goes through the journey of one of my narratives or one of my books, that having spent so much time with me, that by the end of it, they find themselves with themselves, that they're back where they started in some way because they've come to recognize themselves on my pages, mm -hmm. that all the people who read my work hopefully will see similarities of our existence on my pages. Hmm. Hmm. That's a, um, and in so doing sort of bring them closer to you, but maybe bring them more closer sort of cosmically to everybody that, that these are, that these differences potentially, even though they seem large, even though, uh, as the, as the question submitter said, you know, we, we live in this bubble. I can't possibly, uh, understand what you've been through. I can't possibly sort of relate to it. It's like, I think, I think what I'm hearing you saying is, well, yes, you can. <laughs> Uh, and in fact, there there is some commonality there. We'll we'll go through it together. But but I my intention is not to transport you to another place and then let you come back and say, oh, that was a fun adventure. It's it's to actually bring the places together in some way. That should be the purpose of literature, I think. And not only literature; it's the purpose of all human relationships. I mean, when strangers meet, strangers is the operative word. You don't know each other yet, but by the time you've met someone and spent some time with them, the stranger goes away. And that's the same with literature. You spend time with someone on the page, you won't be strangers to them or their experiences by the time you put the work down. If you walk away not having recognized something about yourself in that narrative, then either one or two people are at fault, you as a reader or the writer as a writer. But something has gone wrong because it shouldn't, that should not be the outcome of any human interaction over a sustained period. Hmm. Very good. I, um, I have another maybe technical question, forgive me. I, uh, <laughs> in, in, in your reading, it's it raising me so many questions about just the craft like we were talking about before. Um, I had one, a question about tenses. And forgive me, this is too wonky for folks. <laughs> uh, I actually had to Google to Google to find out the tenses that you were using because I'm not smart enough to know that. So I think it's first person and what they call second person tense, where the, the Google translation says to me, it's a sort of a technique of, of narrative in which the action is driven by a character ascribed to the reader known as you. Uh, and so uh, in How to Make a Slave, you use this tense. Um, I'm wondering, you're, you're obviously an, an expert at your craft. Can you tell us why and how maybe you choose to use tenses and what purpose they serve differently for you as you think about your writing? Um, with the title essay, that came about as a challenge to me from um, someone, a friend of mine, uh, the editor actually of the Best American Essay series. Many, many years ago, we were at his department doing as we often did in those days, um, drinking. <laughs> Where we had had probably way too many drinks. He said, this was right after Barack Obama was, um, was elected. So it was back way back in 2006 or seven. And he said to me, Gerald, now that Barack Obama is elected, is the world post-racial? And I said, by golly, it is. We're done, <laughs> the race is over. <laughs> Uh, and, he, and he said to me, 
Why don't you prove it? Why don't you write an essay? I challenge you to write an essay telling America exactly what you mean by us being post-racial. And I took the challenge. I said, I'll do it. And the next day, uh, well, I sobered up and I thought, how am I going to do that? I can't possibly. <laughs> the world is not. But I started trying to do it as an op-ed. And my goal was to give the reader instructions for how to be post-racial. The working title was how to be post-racial. And as I worked my way through that, as so often happens with my essays, uh, the beginning idea was dropped somewhere along the way and a new idea formed. And I followed it because it was clear to me upon reflection, no, we're not post-racial. I don't even know how we can be post-racial. Hmm. So I dropped that idea, but what remained was me speaking in the second person. Or if you want to be more technical, the imperative mood, which is when the narrator is instructing the reader to do something. Right, right. And so I'm giving instructions throughout the essay, do this, do this, do this, do this, which was supposed to lead us to being post-racial. That's not going to happen. But it quickly became something else that occurred to me that we can't be post-racial until we stop being slaves of race, which is ultimately the title of the entire collection, uh, How to Make a Slave. And How to Make a Slave, what I concluded during the course of writing that essay, was um, by allowing thoughts of race to drive your every thought to the point of being self-destructive. Hmm. It had been the case with me for much of my life. Hmm. And so what I was trying to get at in that essay and what I ultimately wrote myself to, and this again goes back to thinking on the page, and I hope readers can see me doing that. I'm trying to figure this out as I go. I concluded that in order to be free of race, I have to stop allowing it to be my master that I could not be a slave to it. And it wasn't until I recognized during the course of that essay, when I was trying to figure out um, how, to, how to teach my kids about race, uh, it wasn't until I concluded that I'm never gonna make any progress in this front until I stopped being dominated and controlled by thoughts of race to the point that they're ruining my life and possibly ruining my kids' life and making me so paranoid that I can't even enjoy myself or my kids' presence. And that, I was sorry, forgive me for looking in the book. That emerges in another uh, smoke, right? The essay smoke about um, your experience in the restaurant, I think, where <laughs> I, I, I do, I very deliberately see you thinking on the page around, for those that, are, that, um, that haven't read it, it's about, uh, well, I'll let you tell it. Gerald, about, about what, what that is. I, I, cer I certainly felt like I could see you working through it at the conclusion of that essay. Um, but I don't know if you want to say more about, about that. Just a brief synopsis of the essay. It's something that I've noticed. I still notice every time I go out to a restaurant. <laughs> uh, that it, it's, it seems slightly more than coincidental that uh, I am often given... If, if my reservations have not in fact been lost and I'm given some really bad seats in a restaurant. Maybe it just so happens that I'm lucky enough to get the bad seat at every <laughs> restaurant I go to. <laughs> but, but it just seems strange to me that I always seem to get put in these, in these weird spots. And, but how can you possibly know? I mean, if the, if, the, if the waiter or waitress doesn't say to you, come this way, Mr. Walker, I have a really bad seat reserved for our black <laughs> customers. <laughs> if they if they don't say that, <laughs> then how do you know? You don't know. You you only have you can only suspect it and only think it. But if it happens often enough, you start to think there's got to be something going on here. Wow. And so um, that, but that again, is either me recognizing a great flaw in society that needs to be corrected. People stop giving the giving the black the black people the bad seats, or it's not happening, and I'm simply imagining it to my own mental detriment. Hmm. My wife doesn't see this stuff. Hmm. She doesn't notice it. My kids don't notice it, which makes me wonder 
<laughs> maybe, maybe it's me. I don't know. But I notice it. And I point it out to them all the time. Did you, did you see these seats? And they, they just don't, they don't know what I'm talking about half the time. But sometimes they'll think, um, uh, yeah, it is, it is happening. But it's something that I often have to um, struggle with. And it's, again, I mean, this idea of um, trying to figure race out is not something that's going to one day, for me, ever be completed. Mm -hmm. I'm always going to be struggling with this stuff, and I'm always going to be trying to figure out, is it me or is it them? I, I don't know, but I, I wrestle with it. But I, but I also understand that I'm wrestling with it. And that is at least where the heroic part that I mentioned earlier comes into play. I am in this daily struggle. I know I'm in this daily struggle. And that helps me be able to sometimes step back and say, the seat is fine. Besides, you're just steps away from the restroom. So if you look at that, you can look that way. Right <laughs> you can, side. You can go right to the bathroom in two steps. So this isn't so bad at all. <laughs> oh, very good. Let me um let me take a couple more from the group. I'm trying to to intersperse uh, some of the questions that I have with, with uh questions from the group. Give me give me one second here. Um so this one says, um, speaking of stereotypes, you seem to have fun with stereotypes in essays like ballers and thieves, taking advantage or manipulating them. Can you talk more about that? And is thieves about Hingham? And uh, I we we've had this before, and we actually struggle with this as a as a book group. Is you know you you may argue that sort of the the whole book is about Hingham in <laughs> somewhere, uh, but I wanted to let you comment on the the question around around stereotypes and uh, can you talk more about how you use them in your writing? Um, well, one of the things that James McPherson mentioned to me when he was teaching me not to use stereotypes. He was also teaching me how to use stereotypes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The stereotypes are ways to make readers comfortable because they recognize the landscape. Mm -hmm. If you throw out a stereotype, people are familiar with it. Oh, I know that story. That's about so-and-so and so-and-so because they've heard it a million times, but that's when you have them because now their guard comes down and they can ease into your story without being uptight or a little defensive. Interesting. And then you can hit them with the truth, which is what I try to do in um, Balling and in Thieves. And as far as um, is Thieves set in Hingham, you better believe it is. <laughs> right there, it's right there in Derby Street. <laughs> Absolutely, it's Hingham. I, I think uh, there's there's a great. Um, I can't remember what you what you call this person, like the the carrot hoarder or something like that. It was very clever. Uh, anyway. Uh, you, you refer to a couple of the people in, in Whole Foods in a specific way. Again, in this idea of, of humor and stereotypes, so, something you just said that back to our discussion about humor is that stereotypes allow folks to bring their guard down. That allows them to exhale kind of like humor does so that folks are, are more receptive to the truth or to the message that you're, that you're having. Are there, are there other constructs that you use to try to put people in a place where they're maybe more open, they don't come in as rigid, they don't come in as defensive, or if they do, you've got a technique to disarm them in some ways so that they're ready to hear what you have to say. You want all my secrets, don't you? <laughs> well, let me, I, let me give you the context, yeah. of the, <laughs> the context of the question. I sometimes think about this in the context of, of what Hingham Unity Council does sometimes is that these discussions can be difficult. And if we're going to be... Uh, respectful and thoughtful and productive, there needs to be a certain trust in the room. There needs to be a certain, okay, I'm ready to, to be vulnerable. I'm ready to go there. And someone maybe needs to give me a signal that that's going to be okay. And maybe it is humor, or maybe it is, you know, a series of ground rules, something more formal. Um, but I do think that if there is a way in which we can continually do that for folks, for difficult discussions, it really provides an opportunity to have some of those breakthrough moments that that at least I can say for HUC more broadly is, is trying to facilitate more of. Um, so if you do have secrets, yes, I'd like to I'd like to know them all. <laughs> I don't mind I don't mind revealing my secrets. I'm a nonfiction writer. I have, I have no secrets in my life. Is <laughs> um, but I do have strategies because I am a writer, and um, so one of the things that I do, and you mentioned this earlier, 
um, is that I make fun of myself. Mm. And when I point the blame at someone who's failing, it's usually at me. Mm. As you read each of these essays, if there's anyone who is being blamed for falling short of being an ideal citizen and father, it's yours truly. <laughs> and that's and that's my goal. And I, again, I don't want to keep invoking my students as if this is a class, it's not a class, but I do tell my students that it's just much, much better to, instead of doing that when you're writing to your readers, you just turn that finger this way hmm. and make yourself the subject of your essays who stands to learn something from making mistakes. Hmm. And I make mistakes throughout the essay collection. And if there's someone being made fun of, more often than not, it's myself. You mentioned my self-depreciating humor. That's kind of the, the, the key to my whole literary life, <laughs> is, to, is to put myself on display, to say, watch me. And this, again, goes to the strategy, uh, Andrew, of what you speak of in ways that you and the Unity Council are trying to get to people. If you want to signal to your members that it's okay to be vulnerable and open and honest, you begin by being vulnerable, open and honest. You set the example. Mm. So I want readers to see me trying to figure race out, trying to understand society, trying to understand race relations, trying to understand white people, trying to understand black people, trying to understand this stuff. I'm in a constant struggle to try to figure these things out. And readers, you get to witness me doing this on the page. And if you can see me being willing to make mistakes, being willing to humiliate myself now and then, being willing to learn, then I think it gives readers license to do the same. It's okay for you to do, do it too. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I think that's a great message, especially for folks. I mean, for the folks that are that are on the call that um, it, it can be it can be a little scary or, or uh, I don't know, frightening, maybe it's a little overstated, but but to to do that, but in so doing, maybe you it, you maybe think you're sort of giving something up, but maybe you're actually gaining something back. I potentially for yourself, which is I did it, I've survived it, and maybe I you know feel like I could do it again. And for other folks also to say, well, if he or she or they could do it, maybe I can, or if that's going to be the tone in the environment that I find myself in right now, then then maybe I feel a little bit more like I could do that, whether or not you do or not, or someone chooses to do so or not. It's it's I think it's a good reminder for for us to the extent that folks are here on this call trying to you know connect more broadly with like minded folks to to take some risks in that sense to be more vulnerable and to um, and also maybe not uh, rec and to recognize folks are at different points on that journey um, because maybe for some folks that's very easy and for some folks that's harder for some folks are just scared of the whole thing and I, I don't know if, if there's probably a parallel here to your students and other folks that you've that you've mentored around their path along that progression as well, whether that's as a writer, as someone that's interested in issues of, of race, um, that there's something where the idea of meeting people where there are, but but doing the work to go deeper, whether that's from A to B or Q to Q to R, that that is something that um, I wonder if you've had experience kind of navigating some of those different points along the line for people. Absolutely. Um, when I teach, um, at Emerson, and even when I taught at Bridgewater, uh, both institutions are predominantly uh, white institutions. I had more minority students at Bridgewater than I do at Emerson. I rarely get a black student in my classes. But when I do, they often write about race. My black students write about race probably at least 50% of the time when they write an essay. My white students will not touch race with a 10 foot pole except every once in a while, someone will try it. <laughs> and it never ends well. <laughs> I'll, tell <you. clears throat> I'll tell you why. Um, well, I won't, no, I won't say that it doesn't end well. It potentially could be a train wreck, but I won't let it be. Mm. Because I recognize the courage it takes for white students to write about race. Because they don't want to do it not because they feel the subject should be off limits for them, but they're afraid of saying the wrong thing. Right. And often my white students who want to write about race 
are the students who are most interested in having good race relations, or they wouldn't even touch on, wouldn't even be thinking about this stuff. Right. So these are the good ones who want to do it, but they're terrified of offending someone or saying the wrong thing or just a miss, or using the wrong word or, or any number of things that could result in a backlash. So they're terrified of doing it. But every once in a while, someone will. And I had a dream semester a, 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 about a year ago where one of my students decided I'm going to write an essay about, about race. And it, it was a great piece. It was He wrote about being in a college dorm room and some rap song came on and he was tense the entire time because he knew it had the n-word in it <laughs> and he knew that they were getting closer and closer and closer to it and he was sitting there just wondering they were all white kids and he was wondering what are we going to do when we get to this word what are we going to do and he was so he stressed out about it and finally he got to it and he watched the different reactions some people shut down completely some mouthed the word but didn't say it and some just blurted out <laughs> <laughs> that was the opportunity, and so we took it. Um, and so this caused him a great deal of anxiety, and he wanted to write about it. And so he wrote this fantastic piece about it. Yeah. And um, predictably, I think I had I happened to have one or two black students in that class. Um, some people were some people criticized him for how he was handling this subject, and um, I recognize my responsibility here is not necessarily to shield someone if they made a mistake, but to celebrate the fact that someone who felt he had a great deal at stake, and that's the respect of his peers, to be willing to try it, I'm gonna try it and see what happens. And so I, I had to try to steer the conversation in such a way that he wasn't given a pass if he if it was a failure of craft, but also to recognize that he's stepping completely out of his comfort zone and we ought not beat him back into it because he may never venture out again mm. if we don't allow him to make a mistake if in fact he'd made a mistake. You've got to be willing to allow people to not be experts on this stuff. Yeah, and not be penalized for the attempt. Hmm. And I and I said this very thing to the class, and I told them that my dream semester would be for every white student in the classroom to write one of their three essays about race. Hmm. All of them, just hmm. do it. Let's do it and we'll talk about the pieces. We won't necessarily have to talk about race. We're not sociologists. I'm not a sociologist. We're writers. So we can talk about craft and we can talk about the way the story is told and if there are better strategies or different approaches we could have tried. But by golly, we can't have the subject of race be the domain of the minority students. When, as I said, no one who lives in America lives outside of race. We're all in this. Right. So I would like to see more of my white students talk about race, even if they don't feel um, they have the expertise or the language to do it successfully. Yeah, and I, I've heard this described recently in this um, this other piece I'm reading around, uh, the waking among the woke, <laughs> which is this idea that maybe the ultra woke, however you want to describe that, and that's not pejorative in this sense at all. Um, but that there is there are folks that are further along in their journey of, of what I'll just say racial consciousness, willing to have these discussions. Maybe they do use all the right terminology, et cetera, et cetera. And there are folks that are waking. And that sometimes, especially, there's a risk among the woke that rather than uh, trying to make sure that the the group is aligned around the folk that folks that are you know, very much calling for. <laughs> horrible horrible policies and procedures that would sort of threaten their existence spend a lot of time mincing words around the waking even though they're trying um and i think that's a good message uh and i think i i hope that's one of the things that that we were trying to do in the unity council is to is to welcome the waking if you will and like you said celebrate that process with all its bumps and bruises and and cuts and scars and everything else because there's this, like, like we're talking about at the very beginning, there's a certain vulnerability and bravery and courageousness in, in simply willing to show up and engage 
Um, and I think that, uh, that that process in and of itself is ultimately where we would like more folks to arrive uh, versus, you know, uh, and, and then turn the attention to the folks that are very much more mean spirited about these issues and not trying. Uh, right. And so I think that's a good message. I think that's a good message for us. Um, let me ask you, I've got one more here. Um, uh, if you, if you wouldn't mind, um, uh, what is your, if you, if you're comfortable answering this, what, what is your experience living and raising sons in Hingham? And how did you and your family choose to move um, to Hingham? Um, well, we moved to Massachusetts generally because that's where the jobs were. So we, um, I met my wife um, uh, many, many years ago, 30 now or so. I don't know. <laughs> like it's a great story about the dress. The dress is a phenomenal story that if you... Uh, I, we could get to that later, but that's an amazing, amazing story. And we, yeah, we should talk about that. It, it is a pretty, it's a fun story. Uh, but my wife and I met um, uh, as undergrads um, um, in Chicago, and then we moved to Iowa City, and then she got a job in Bridgewater. And so we came out here, and so we didn't decide, you know what, let's go to Massachusetts and raise our kids in, in Bridgewater and in Hingham. Um, that's where the jobs were, and so that's where um, our kids were going to be raised. We were in um, Bridgewater for, uh, let's see, I think the boys were probably 11 and 13 when the private little school that they attended suddenly closed because the, they couldn't afford to keep it open. The schools in Bridgewater are not, are not top notch. Um, in fact, they're pretty bad. And we did not want our kids in a bad school um, in Bridgewater or anywhere else. And at the time I had just started working at Emerson. And so we needed to find a place between Bridgewater and um, Emerson. We had friends in Hingham. Um, they said it's a fantastic town, if pricey. Um, <laughs> and so we found a little bitty house here and uh, we, we moved here. And my oldest was just about to start high school, which is a difficult time to transition. Yeah. And uh, my youngest was uh, in middle school. And um, so this is where they came of age. And my sons uh, have never had a single racial incident in this town, hmm. nothing. Hmm. I've waited for them. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was on edge any day now. I kept telling my wife, it's gonna happen, yeah. nothing. Nothing's ever happened. One of the essays in How to Make a Slave um, is about, in fact, me taking the opportunity to drive my son to and from high school so that when these when these racial incidents right. broke, I'd be on the ready. I'd be right there to say, OK, let me talk you through this. This is what we've got to do. Right, right, right. Never, nothing ever happened. Nothing ever happened. Um, so I, so I, I, was, I was about to say, so it's been fantastic. Maybe it hasn't been fantastic. Maybe a little racial skirmish might have been good for them. I don't know. <laughs> um, all I know is that they have been completely welcomed here. And um, if they hope to get material from some uh, racial incident as artists at some point in the future, they will not be set in Hingham. <laughs> That's, I, I, I get, like you said, I, I, I guess that's good. Um, I, I, that's probably certainly good on multiple levels. Uh, let me, um, let me, uh, we have got, I don't think we have any more questions from the chat. I would, I would like to ask if you wouldn't mind, um, for those that don't know it, um, the, the story about, um, the dress, um, I, it would be fun to hear you tell it. Uh, I've read it and I don't know if everyone has, but it's, it's, a, it's a wonderfully romantic story. Um, and if you're okay, kind of sharing it with us, I think, I think folks would enjoy it. Okay, sure. Um, I was a student at the University of Iowa completing my um, undergraduate degree. And my wife was a student at the University of Illinois in Chicago completing hers. We did not know each other yet. I happened to be given the opportunity to study for the summer in Chicago in a program called the Summer Research Opportunity Program. And I thought, I'll do it. They would pay for my housing. 
I would spend the summer in Chicago, see family and friends, and I would go back to Iowa City. And so I, I got in this program and I um, happened to be reading a book in the park one day when this young person approached me who I thought was about 16. Uh, and I assumed she was lost, um, but she was, it turns out, was a fellow undergraduate and my future wife, and uh, who happened to also be in the same summer writing program. So we struck up a conversation and we chatted and it was great. And I um, caught up with her a little bit later in the summer and we began spending time together and um, quite enjoyed each other's company. Alas, I would be leaving to go back to Iowa and she still had a year to complete. So I assumed as much as I liked her, I would never see her again <laughs> after August. And uh, about a week before I was about to leave, we happened to be um, walking through downtown Chicago on a very, very hot day. So hot, in fact, that as we passed a department store and my wife saw this amazing wedding dress in the window, she stopped in her tracks and she saw it and said, what an amazing wedding dress. It's so adorable. I said, it is adorable. And she said, I ought to go try that thing on. And I said, well, why not? Because it's probably got some AC in there. We're, we're <laughs> sweltering. <laughs> And so she decided to go in and, and try in the dress. So we went into the store and she asked to, um, to try it on. And um, uh, I, uh, I happened to stand with a, a bunch of guys who, um, as guys often are, uh, prisoners of these situations where their wives are trying things on and we're just standing around chatting sports. And so we were doing that. And uh, my wife came out of the of the dressing room with the dress on and, and someone said, oh my God, what a beautiful wedding dress that would make. And all the women in the area, as if by some you know, radar, just swung around, wedding ah. dress, who is getting married? I think that young woman there is getting married and everybody descended on her and said, oh my goodness, congratulations, congratulations. And all the guys started slapping me on the back and congratulating me and telling me, giving me advice. And one guy gave me a cigar <laughs> and everybody assumed we were getting married. We just came in to get out of the heat. And then the saleswoman said to my wife, so how will you pay for this cash or, or credit? Well, what could she possibly do? There's a big crowd of people around this. <laughs> she said, credit. <laughs> <laughs> and so the sales lady went and, and, and got the dress prepared and wrapped it up. And we walked out of this department store with this wedding dress. And so I called my parents and I said, I'm engaged. <laughs> <laughs> and Brenda called her parents and said, I think we just got engaged. And so it was. Amazing. I went back to Iowa City and um, she followed me out a year later when she finished. But it was from that moment that we bought the um, wedding dress that we decided that we were going to be together for the rest of our lives. And when we did, in fact, um, wed five years later, um, she wore that wedding dress. That's so amazing. I love that story. Uh, I haven't let on uh, because we could probably tell all sorts of stories that I grew up in Chicago. And I think if I remember, or I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. I think if I remember, it was Neiman Marcus. Yes. And you're walking down Michigan Avenue. And I, I know exactly where that is, was. I think it's still there. And so I've got this amazing image, literally, not only because the writing is so good, but because I'm, I can literally see myself there and just thinking to myself, what a story. What a story. So... Thank you for sharing. It was, it, was, it, was, it was pretty cool. We were stunned. I have to say, we walked out of the store. My wife is carrying this dress. And, Amazing. And we, didn't, we didn't say anything. We were just we were just done, except that I reached my hand over and she reached her hand over and um, and we just held hands and and walked down the street trying to figure out what just happened. Amazing. Well, I, I uh, we don't have any more uh, questions from the group, and I, I think that um, we might we might choose to leave it there because it's such a beautiful ending. Uh, I wanted to just. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Um, like I said, I'm a total fanboy. I was very nervous uh, tonight, um, but you made it you made it very easy to to be at ease, and um, I really appreciate you joining us. It's been a it's been a really special evening. Thank you, Andrew. And I suspect that everybody who listened to this exchange knows that you have a future in this. If you'd like to, <laughs> you were no, you were you were absolutely outstanding, and I am I I've been interviewed many, many, many times. And I think this is probably uh, probably one of my favorite um, exchanges. You were outstanding. Well, I'm grateful. I, for that. I have a question for Gerald. Um, yes, 
I haven't had a chance to read a book yet, but I'm thinking or hoping that we could have a book read sometime. And after I, after I finish reading the book, I'll talk to a few colleagues of mine here. And if you wouldn't mind doing a book read for us sometime in February. Sure, sure. Yeah. I did one not long ago, but I like to read. And um, I'm always happy to have an audience. So I'd be happy, be happy to do it again. Okay, so how can I get in touch with you? Um, probably through that long bio that Andrew read. At the <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> we could probably help you, Arthur. I think that's yeah. Just just email the info at Hang Immunity, and I'll 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 hook you up. Okay, I'll do that. All okay, right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Arthur. it's a pleasure meeting you, Gerald, and it was a nice discussion. I learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you for attending. All right. Thank you. Thank you, folks, for being here. Please visit uh, Hang Immunity. Um, uh,